Lonely Monk Productions. I don't know if y'all have heard Cinderella by Remy Wolf yet, but yo. That's my joy! Hey, yo, displace the guilt and embrace the pleasure. You're tasting things that don't need to be measured. You ain't being judged, you won't get a What's score. good, friends and family, neighbors near and far? Welcome to an all-new episode of the Yo, That's My John podcast. The podcast, website, brand, movement, way of life dedicated to the embrace and championing of your passions. I'm your host, Nate Runkle, a.k.a. Jonathan Banks, a.k.a. Nate 3.0. Back at it again with yet another episode of the podcast. As always, I hope this podcast finds you all in good health and in good spirits. On today's episode, I finally sit down for a chat with my pal John Vatisse from WXPN. We cover a wide range of stuff, and the conversation was every bit of an absolute joy as I knew it would be. And that's coming up in a bit here. But first, a little sup check. So, sup... Hope all is well with you and yours. Things are staying busy over here on my end. You know, this past weekend, I DJed a daddy-daughter dance for a bunch of elementary and middle school kids and their fathers. And it was a pretty cute event. And there are some observations I made while doing so that I would like to share with you now. Which, first, I feel like the daddy-daughter dance had to be invented by someone who was probably neither daddy nor daughter. And that isn't to say that they didn't have fun, but it was really funny to watch these dads, some of who were wearing what we affectionately like to call our wedding funeral suit for those who never really have a reason to dress up like that outside of a celebration of marriage or death. You know, watching them awkwardly stand around the dance floor while their daughters sing and dance with their friends. But y'all, not all dads. Shout out to the dad who maybe only ever left the dance floor to go to the bathroom or get a beverage. My guy was putting in work. My favorite moment of the evening was at the end of the cha-cha slide, my guy walking off the dance floor, dabbing sweat from his brow while loudly proclaiming to the girls on the dance floor, good job, guys. (laughs) Fucking love that dude. But my big observation, the biggest one, and what I mainly want to take some time to talk about was completely music related. And that is the power and popularity of one Taylor Swift. And I know what you're saying. No duh, Nate. She's the biggest pop star in the world. But y'all, after this weekend, I feel like that even downplays just how huge she is. My entire night was fielding requests for more and more Tay Tay, and not just the hits, deep album cuts. And they knew every single word and sang as if it were their own teardrops on that guitar, so to speak. It was wild. I originally started to pace it out, you know, trying to find some other songs to slide in between all of the requests. But after a while, it just became so abundantly clear that all they wanted to do was listen to Taylor Swift, no matter what OCD I may have about playing the same artist back to back to back to back. And so I gave in. And that dance became a stop on the Errors Tour. We visited songs from her first album, songs from the latest, and everywhere in between Taylor's versions, when available, of course. And these girls at no point got tired of it. Guys, they requested all 10 minutes of All Too Well Taylor's version, and God damn it, I played all 10 minutes of All Too Well Taylor's version. I legitimately cannot think of another artist that ever could command an entire night like this. And not two or three people that were into it, but the entire crowd, all ages, little ones, just starting elementary school, and all the way to the older ones preparing to leave. And not just enjoying and dancing, but singing along to every word as if their lives depended on it. It was truly magical. You know, one other thing I wanted to mention ahead of my chat with John here is the loss of the Grape Room. If you haven't heard this past week, we lost yet another independent music space here in the area suddenly. And this one hurt me for so many reasons. I've talked about it a bunch on the show, but that was the venue and stage that first took a chance on me, not just as a solo artist, as Nate 3.0, but all the way back to when Randy Major and I were doing the Impact Players. 
and so many great artists and bands grace that stage. You've heard me say it nothing short of 50 million times on this show, and I do it again in this interview, but Jeff Buckley played on that stage. G. Love played on that stage, and those two alone made that place a sacred ground to me. And now, it's no more. And that bums me the hell out. Guys, support local music. Get out there. If you got a night out and you like listening to live music, hit up an independent venue whether you know who is on the bill or not. You know, your favorite bands didn't get their start playing thousand-seat rooms overnight. These places are vital. So shout out to Scooter for keeping the grape running as long as he did, man. You know, I'm going to miss the hell out of that place. If you haven't done so already, jump on over to www.yothatsmyjohn.com and check out all of the links to the website, the mailing list, the merch, the socials, all of it. Yothatsmyjohn.com is your one-stop shop for all that pops. And you can follow us on those aforementioned socials at Yo That's My John. Okay, that's all out of the way. Let's get on with the show. My guest today got his start at WXPN as a volunteer in 2006 before coming aboard full-time in 2012. Besides his work with 88.5, he is an accomplished music writer and live music photographer, freelancing for outlets like The City Paper and Magnet, just to name a few. Currently, you can hear him every Tuesday night on WXPN from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. for the WXPN Local Show, and on Fridays from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. on the newly made weekly 90s throwback show, What's the Frequency? Folks, it is my honor to welcome to the show, John Vatisse. Ladies and gentlemen, I am joined today by the great John Vatisse. John, thank you for joining me on Yo, That's My John. Nate, thank you for having me. This is awesome. It's been a long time coming. It absolutely has. You know, um, you are one of my favorite people, uh, not just at WXPN, but in general uh, in the music community. Uh, so I am so happy that we're finally getting a chance to kind of uh, 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 do this on my show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember the first time I met you, it was, either, was it either like... Noncom or was it um at the um sing us home and we've just been like swapping messages on instagram for like months and months and months and finally it was like oh my god our worlds have like overlapped to the point where like we can have we can find a date to do this so exactly. hell yeah i'm happy to be here <laughs> exactly i'm super stoked and and like you know what i was what i was kind of leading with there is i feel like uh, personally this is just my own opinion um that you are one of the most important people in the Philadelphia music scene, at, specifically because not only uh, do you cover a, and uh, go to so many local shows, but I feel like um, you perfectly kind of uh, report on it as well. Um, oh, and and so you. and so, um, I love you for that, and I'm glad. Oh, we're thank talking. you, man. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what I would do without concerts. I would probably, I would probably read a lot of books. I think I really do enjoy reading, but um, oftentimes there's nowhere I would rather be than out at a show, and it's pretty nice that I'm able to like find a way that like this is part of my job. <laughs> this is part of what I get to do for like for my my career. I get to go to concerts and sometimes shoot photos of them and often write about them and. Do a lot of other things, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, well, one of the things that's amazing is whenever I've seen you at a show or whatnot is that not only, even if you're working, even if you're shooting, even if you're, you know, covering it or whatnot, I still see you absolutely enjoying it every single time. And that is mm. so admirable because it's very easy to burn out and just, like, become jaded and like, yeah, okay, I'm at another live show, whatever. But, like, you <laughs> always seem to be enjoying yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's it's great. I mean, I, I, I go to shows that I like. Um, I go to shows that I'm stoked about. And yeah, I mean, I, I as someone who like never really was able to like do music at any kind of like, like a lot of times folks ask me like, oh, do you play music? Do you play guitar? And like, I so I, yes, I know rudimentary guitar. I just did this concert pick video where like I played Wonderwall. That's about the extent of my uh, guitar playing right there. <laughs> um. So, like, I've never really been able to do it, like, for myself, and I figure, like, the next best thing is just to, like, watch other people do it, like, really, really awesomely well and support them in other other ways. Yeah. I mean, it's part of the—like, I, I, I do that. Like, I, I like 
working in the studio here and doing that. Um, I like to, like taking pictures of folks as they're doing it at shows. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a fun way to be involved in music when you don't have the skill to actually be involved in music. <laughs> Sure, sure. Well, that, that, that's uh, that's been my joke is like uh, my music career failed. So now I just um, mm. am going to help all of my friends' music careers do better. Mm. Oh, <laughs> it didn't Wait, really so what fail. Did, but you know. what what did you were, uh, did you do? You play like drums? Did you sing? What did you do? I play guitar and I sing. Um, my uh, my primary stuff was kind of like. Um, uh, acoustic hip hop, kind of like a G Love oh. kind of thing, and stuff like that. Which actually, I was going oh, yeah. to mention. Um, uh, uh, at any point, if you want to invite me to come down to the key and do a session, I will gladly. Uh... <laughs> we'll consider that. <laughs> That's right. Put me on the on the long list. Um, but before I get ahead of myself with all of this, um, let's jump in the wayback machine and let's uh, yeah. let's get to uh, little tiny uh, John growing up uh, here in Ambler, which is crazy. Yes. Um, yes. Wh- so like. Uh, uh, you you grew up in Ambler. Like, what, what what was your like household like musically? Like, was there music always playing or? Uh, every I, I think I wish I had a better story about that. And I do think that like my family influenced my formative musical taste. Like, I love Simon and Garfunkel. Like, I have a cat named Garfunkel. So like, I love like Simon and Garfunkel, and that is directly tied to like my mom when I was young would put in the Simon and Garfunkel tape and play it to help get me to go to sleep you know so I uh I I get Simon and Garfunkel from my mom I get the Beastie Boys from my older brother I get REM from my older sister uh my younger sister like got me into like kind of more like the um you know later 90s alternative stuff like garbage and soul coughing um which was kind of like I was I was aware of that stuff, I think, just from being a little bit older than her, but not, like, her enthusiasm for it kind of made me give it a second chance. I was I, I was an angsty goth kid, except I didn't do the whole goth thing. I was an angsty goth, m- mentally a goth kid, who dressed up like I do now in, like, shabby sweaters and flannels and, like... I was not. Ha- I was. <laughs> I was really annoying to be around. I'm sure, but uh, <laughs> but um, but no. Like everyone, everyone around me kind of pointed me in some musical direction. Um, uh, whether or not, like, I mean, my family are all like in. Uh, like my dad was an engineer. Like my sister, like is a nurse. My brother uh, was like a marine biologist briefly until he became an educator. So it was like, you know, my family all kind of did stuff in like the sciences and I have no skill for that whatsoever. (laughs) Um, And, uh, and so what I'm good at is like writing and uh, shooting pictures. And, um, and so I would kind of listen to the music that like my family listened to and like kind of find stuff on my own, like, Nine Inch Nails was the first, like, this is my band. Not that, not that like, I mean, they, they were huge by the time I found them, but still, like, nobody in my family was really, like, into that, like, into super angry, loud, early 90s, mid-90s music. So it was, like, that was, like, and it kind of captured my my very middle child vibe. Uh, <laughs> so, um that 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 was kind of my first thing that I kind of came to on my own. Um, I'm going to real quick side side note, um, mostly because I, I do this a lot because uh, ADHD and whatnot. But um, mm. but uh, from that time period, here's my here's my um, band that I feel like why are why are we still why, whatever happened and why 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 do we let them out of the conversation? Um, mm. Were you a, were you a Stabbing Westward guy? Because that first Stabbing Westward album was like my everything. I want to say I know that my friend Josh, who is another like so, all right, talking about musical influences, like Josh was someone I connected with uh, through high school. He was like a few years younger than me. Like his older sister was actually in my grade, uh, but like we were both into like really brooding uh, music. So like he and I kind of bonded over that. But then he helped me like kind of discover all this other stuff, like Cocktoo Twins and like um, Jeff Buckley and. Um, so I think that like by the time I was like late teens, like about to graduate high school, my, my, uh, my listening vibe was less locked in like the whole super angry, like misanthropic, whatever of my early teens and more kind of like, uh, 
cautiously optimistic and like bro- a broader palette. Um, but like Stabbing Westward was a band that Josh was hugely into. Um, I don't. I remember they played the Trocadero when we were teens. I don't think I went to that show. Um, I forget the name of their record that had the very long title. Help me out. Uh, oh, um, Wither, Blister, Burn, and Peel. I thank think you. Maybe. Yes, okay. <laughs> Wither, Wither, Blister, Burn, and Peel. Man, I'm gonna have to like dig up a track for that from that for what's the frequency? Damn, yeah. I've not thought about stabbing Western in a really long while. So thank you, Nate, for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm um, here for. <laughs> yeah, but no, I mean, th- there's there's a lot of like that post Nine Inch Nails kind of still indie slash underground, but not as like aggro. Like there's another pretty good band called Sister Machine Gun that we really liked that we would go to see them. I saw them a couple times at the track. Um <laughs> this is more campy for sure, but do you remember my life with the Thrill Kill Cult? Oh my God, yes. I, we saw them like three or four times at the truck. I do not know why we were so enthusiastic about this band, but they put on like really fun, ridiculous live shows. And like when you're a teenager and like you're taking the train to Chinatown and you're walking over to the truck and there's like this line of just like vampiric dressed people and you go inside the club and there's all this dry ice smoke and there's these very doomy individuals on stage like dancing and doing this music like there's this element of like danger that's kind of exciting and also really fun and also like really positive sure. in a way sure. like it was like a positive uh uh not outlet but a positive avenue a positive thing i could engage with uh when i was kind of like feeling generally not that way um yeah I dig it. Um, so here's my here's my question. Uh, being uh, an Ambler guy, um, did you ever? Uh, uh, here's uh, it's two twofold, um, and they're both in completely different directions. One, um, did you ever uh, make it out to Lansdale for any of the hardcore shows? Because that was a scene for a while. Once, once, and once only. Because um, not not a bad experience at all. It was more just like by the time I was aware that it was happening. I was living in the city, um, living in Philly, going to Temple, and uh, mostly going, if I was going to see live music, I was going to see a show, like, around, like, downtown somewhere. Um, But there's a photo um, I took, uh, so I went to Temple for uh, journalism and photography, uh, and and I was an English minor, so I, I guess I'm, like, one of the few people who you could say, like, uh, went to Temple for journalism, and actually, that's what I, I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, uh, I went to I went to Temple for photo, and um, it was one of the classes. I I think it was like the second level photojournalism class where you were supposed to produce. There was an assignment where it was like produce a magazine uh, photo feature, um, uh, and so I had reconnected with uh, a kid I went to high school named Jeremy. Um, Jeremy Rosa, and he was in a band at that time. Like, I knew him in high school playing in, like, death metal bands and stuff. Like, really heavy, like, kind of satirical, but still just, like, like blast beats and screaming and that sort of thing. And then he got into hardcore, and he was playing in a band called 13 PFP. Heck and yeah. And they, their, their claim to fame was that they were, uh, quote-unquote, PA horncore. It was like a hardcore band with ska horns, basically. Um, and so I did this photo feature assignment going out to a show. I forget what the venue was. It was some VFW Hall-esque place in Lansdale. And 13 PFP played, and it was like seven other bands because, of course, they did. there was because it was a hardcore show. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah like I uh it was a lot of fun uh but it was just like for me a bit of a like at that point in my life living in Philly and stuff it was a bit of a far drive so I never really um got further into the scene than that um but I did recently um I have all these old cassettes from growing up and I'm like every once in a while I'll bring a few of them into the station and like digitize them like so that way, you know, they're 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 gonna disintegrate and go away if they're not already like sounding crappy. So I'm trying to like save the stuff that I don't know is actually out if it's actually out there anywhere. And I did that with their record um 
Redefine, I think is what it's called. Uh, really good. Like, I was like, oh, what's this going to be like? I don't know. I remember this band. It was Jeremy's band. I did the photo thing on them. Like, I listened to him like, oh, fuck yeah, this holds up. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, my buddy uh, Mitch was in that band. Uh, Mitch Martinez, hmm. who um, was the vocalist, right? That's right. Um, Hell yeah. We went to high school together. Um, as a matter of oh fact, most of the people in those bands were people I went to high school with. And that's how I ended up in the scene because I wasn't I wasn't a hardcore kid, but I loved all of their bands. Um, there mm. was one band that I still to this day uh, feel like would have blown up. And, and I feel and like there's a laundry list on why it didn't happen. But um, I don't know if you remember Chine. Mm hmm. Uh, um, but they were incredible. And if, if you're digitizing stuff for the station, I have a disc for you because uh, oh, fuck yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, they were they were phenomenal. Um, uh, Kevin Mooney, who's the bass player, was someone I went to high school with, um, has gone on to a bunch of other um, Inkling and uh, uh, Drop Anchor, mm. a bunch of other bands that are you know still playing around. Um, mm. But man, Shine was just something special. That's amazing. Well, so you you uh, you went up or uh, you grew up in Lansdale. What's it like for you, like, f- I, 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 it seems like we're about the same age-ish. Yeah, um, I think I'm two years like- older than you, something like that. Okay, cool. What's it like for you, or was it like, like, maybe 15 or whatever years after you were involved in that scene to see a band like The Wonder Years blow up? It confuses the hell out of me, to be honest. Like, uh, <laughs> it's so weird. It's. Uh, I was actually just talking to somebody about. It. I don't know if you saw. Um, they shot a documentary uh, recently um, uh, about the Lansdale hardcore scene, and okay. um, and and it confused me because it was about like that era. So it was like right after I was done. So like mm. I'm like, wait a minute, no, the movie. You want to make a movie? Go back a few more years. Like, uh, yeah. But, um, but no, those guys are incredible too, and it's just it's so amazing to watch them like like you know watch uh dan like you know not just with the wonder years but also like the you know the solo album and the um aaron, the aaron west, west project yeah yeah like um it's just phenomenal to to watch like um and it's and it, there's a bit of like hometown pride to it like even if like they release something that i'm just like yeah it's not for me but like uh hell yeah i'm glad you're doing it you know yeah and the wonder years have the distinction of uh so i'll i'll preface this uh, just in case any of your listeners aren't familiar uh, part of what I do at XPN um, of the many myriad things I do at XPN one of the things that I am most stoked about that I get to work on is a thing called the Key Studio Sessions which is um, it's a weekly-ish series where I bring in Philly bands to perform live in the studio um, and uh, and it's like a total genre range like I've had uh, I, I had a band last year called Abasha that's like a Death Grips esque like industrial hip hop band, and I've had like really gentle folk singers, and I've had jazz groups, and like it's 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 really fun, and um, I love doing it. And um, I had the Wonder Years in, I want to say it was like 2017 or 2018. It was around the release of their album Sister Cities, and they hold the distinction of being one of I think three bands in the whole. 12, 13 years that I've been doing this that came in and they did their entire session in one take. Wow. You know? Like, usually usually bands will come in and they'll they'll play a song and they'll be like, oh, cool, we got it. And then they'll do their next song and be like, oh, um, actually, uh, I, I didn't like how that ended. Let's do a second take just for safety. Or they'll be like, um, that was pretty good. Let's do another one just to make sure, you know. And, and so you, these days the average is bands will come in and they'll play each song twice. And I'll take the better one to use for like the video and the uh, the video that we post online and the audio that we put on the radio. Um, uh, but the Wonder Years, they like came in, and they just kind of like we did our sound checking and was like, all right, you guys rolling, cool, boom, and they just like burned through the the three songs and they're like, all right, we're good, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> and not in a rude way either. They just came in and crushed it, which was like really cool. That's awesome. They're on their shit. They get it. They get it. Um, so my my second question, area question, is when you were in high school and uh, um, uh, and in the area, um, mm. w- what was your music store around here? Um, so there was a bunch of different places. Uh, Rainbow Records was probably my favorite. Rainbow, uh, it's originally a Delaware store, and I believe it may still exist in Delaware. But it was based in East – I'm trying to think if it was East Norriton or Norristown, like where on the geographical boundary it lies. But it was basically at 202 and um, Germantown up that way. 
um, in that big shopping plaza. Uh, shopping plaza is still there. Diner that we used to go to, still there. Uh, Rainbow Records, not there anymore. But uh, they were great because, um, oh boy, I'm, I'm pretty sure I talked about this with uh, with Dan on 25 o'clock too, but uh, uh, do you remember import CDs? Yes, of course. Of course. And, and how, like, uh, like for instance, Beck would release the single for uh, Loser, and there would be the U.S. version, but then there would be, like, two different import versions that have slightly different B-sides. And, like, if you're a super Beck fan, as I was, you, you want to collect all of them. Um, and so I, uh, I would go to Rainbow Records, and they were always, like, really diligent about carrying imports and or being able to order stuff where it's, like, if you know this thing exists... Um, but you don't know, uh, like you, you, we don't have it in stock. We'll get it for you, kind of, uh, kind of thing. At least more so than the mall stores were. Like the wall wouldn't do that. Love the wall. Love their 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 lifetime guarantee sticker on so many of my uh, uh, collection uh, uh, CDs in my collection. But uh, they they weren't the best for like special ordering. But Rainbow was, and they were like very like down to earth, independent, local ish store. Um, and they also carried bootlegs, which I loved. Like I would get like um, like. Nirvana, uh, like trick or treat Halloween bootleg of them playing the Paramount Theater in Seattle in 1991, or like, uh, like the Nine Chanel's demos and remixes compilation, which is like when Trenton Reznor was like first starting out and like sounding like Erasure on his earlier songs. So it was like cool to like, uh, uh, that they would carry this stuff that was like not entirely legal, but still like, um, for like fans. And, like, they knew which bands had those fandoms, and they would stock that stuff. Um, so Rainbow was really good. Um, and then there was also um, a farmer's market off of 309, heading up to the Montgomery Mall, but not quite to the Montgomery Mall. Actually, wait. It was, no, I think that's right. I think it was, like, heading to, but not quite at the Montgomery Mall, this big old farmer's market that had a combination, like, guitar slash uh, instrument slash vinyl, uh, vinyl shop, and I would go there and I would buy old records. So I those are my two go-to go to places. <laughs> yeah, so th- those are my two go-to places, and like I would build my collection that way, and or I would get a bunch of blank tapes and like copy from my friends, and like I would copy albums from Josh and like our friend Liam and our friend Michelle, and like we would just kind of build our collection that way. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I was a I was an import guy and I was a bootleg guy, um, specifically um, Pearl Jam imports um, mm. because they always had the better uh, B sides on their imports and Oasis imports because same thing, uh, the B sides were always like uh, like my my favorite Oasis song of all time is uh, Talk Tonight, which was the the mm. import B side to Wonderwall. Um, yeah. And then also on that import had um, their cover of I Am The Walrus. So, mm-hmm. like, uh, yeah, I, I miss those days. Uh, my wife, Maureen, is uh, a huge Oasis fan. She was a bigger Oasis fan when she was a teenager. Um, I think as she grew up, we've, we've talked about this on, on uh, What's the Frequency in the past. Like, she's come on the radio and played, like, guest DJ. Um, and uh, she, she aged out of Oasis and into Blur. And then all of Damon Albarn's various side projects and solo pursuits and things. And she still, I think, holds both of those bands in, like, super high regard. It's like Bowie, Blur, Oasis, all kind of, like, in the, the her favorites. Um, but when she was young, she really, really, w- like, loved uh, loved the Gallagher Bros. And, um, and she's kind of, as much as I thought I liked the band, she's kind of put me on to all these, like, like deeper cuts and obscurities and like uh, oh you didn't know about the Nebworth gig in 1996 that's legendary and I'm like oh man uh, she's like amazing and has much cooler musical taste and knowledge than me um, but no she has um, I think her favorite is um, Round Our Way is that's a good a great one. one yes and um, and then one that I like that's that's kind of more so silly than anything else from Oasis is uh what's called Bonehead's Bank Holiday, where, like, they just let the dude Bonehead, like, sing a song, and it's kind of, like, freewheeling and just, like, goofy. Um, But no, we have, like, a bunch of, uh, like, similar older Oasis B-sides and 
collections of semi-official nature. <laughs> yeah, the um, oasis. I've been. This is a topic I've been uh, wanting to write about for a while now um, uh, for the show. Um, but uh, I feel like oasis and uh, more so than them, REM. Uh, mm. are in this weird spot where um, they're legendary bands and they're enormous, but for some reason they aren't as big as I feel like they should be in the conversation. Like it almost like, not that they're forgotten, but like, it's like a, like a, yeah, 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 yeah REM, but like, but mm. what a, what a, what a catalog. And then the same thing with like that, that, f- that three album span of Oasis, Mm -hmm. Um, like was everywhere. Like they were Mm -hmm. essentially what Radiohead is now um, at that time, you know, like everybody Mm -hmm. was talking about them. And now I feel like nobody ever brings them up. (laughs) It's weird. I still see things like every once in a while, like Liam will say something cheeky about Noel in like some BBC interview and then like the Guardian will take it and run with it and it'll be a headline and like oh is Oasis get, getting back together like Liam says fuck no never or like you know and like they probably will invent like at some point the money will be like way too much because it's weird cause, like they could they could probably if Oasis toured and Oasis toured the states they could probably if not arenas they could probably do a stadium tour which they never did back in the day mm-hmm. um, at least in US um and R like I feel like yeah REM maybe doesn't put themselves out there as much like they're all like Peter Buck is doing like um uh what's it called Filthy Friends was the project he did with Corin Tucker um and the baseball project which yeah. uh I've I've never really vibed with that but I have like really good friends who like Joey Joey, Joey o is yeah. a huge <laughs> baseball project fan um uh and, and it's like Joey's enthusiasm for that band makes me like that band you know what I mean? <laughs> but like like Peter's just kind of content to be like yeah cool I'm doing this 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 goofy baseball song thing and like they're they're good being like rem was had its time in place and multiple decades and that's done now the end <laughs> yeah it's um, wild and and like i feel like uh there's a bit of label issue there too like because you would think like the label would keep them in the conversation but like there hasn't been like reissues there hasn't been like mm. uh you know packages or anything like that it's just like kind of like yeah all right they're done <laughs> yeah I feel like the last thing along those lines was wasn't there a um in time the best of REM compilation of some sort and this was like in the 20 teens sometime so it wasn't yeah. recent. Yeah. Right. Um, it, like it was pretty fresh on their 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 breakup. Um and yeah, I mean that's and but they're another band too where I think if like REM did decide like yeah, you know what? We do want to play music again while we're still able to. Um like they would probably also do like if not arenas stadium i mean they were doing arenas by the time they broke up and they had been for like a decade and a half so they would probably be able to pull off like a bigger uh scale production um but i think i think too that like it's sort of commendable that they're not like the rolling stones and like we're gonna get out there and play stadiums every two years until we die like um which I'm probably going to see the Rolling Stones this year, um, uh, so I can't knock them too much. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen them, so I kind of would like to. But also, I think it's ridiculous that they're still touring and they've never stopped touring. <laughs> yeah, I, I've never seen them either, and I feel like I, I have to um, because, mm-hmm. like, I feel like it, you know, at one point they're not going to, and then I'm going to be like, well, why didn't I go? You know, like, what else did I have yeah. that was better to do than go see the Stones? <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, yeah. It's like I'll, I'll, I should. It's like one of those like I feel like I should. And I will probably have a great time. You know what we were watching? Um, we were we were watching something on New Year's Eve, um, Maureen and I, and we had um, it was it was either on Hulu or something where like there was those like interstitial like thirty second ad break. Here's a promo for whatever, and there was a promo for the Stones tour that's happening this year, like the Hackney Diamonds tour or whatever. And like I'm watching this, and it's like I guess footage from like a warm-up gig that they did in the uk and it's just like like looking at it like so i i didn't shoot shows that big until very recently like the first stadium show i ever shot was in 2022 it was the red hot chili peppers the strokes and thundercat at citizens bank park and i shot like arena shows before i've shot festivals but shooting a stadium show it's freaking crazy 
Uh, just because, like, one, the level of security that, like, they have to put the photographers through to get there. And then once you get in, like, the photo trench and, like, you're waiting for the band to start and, like, you turn around and you look just, just, just like, you, you turn around and you just, like, sweep your head around the stadium and there's, like, 50,000 people. It's just, like, weird and mind-boggling and, like, like man, stadium shows are crazy. And then, like, like the Chili Peppers got out there and they're, like, playing, like... Californication and all those people are singing along and it's just like a huge rush and like I know that like as like an indie dude or whatever you're not supposed to like big festivals and big stadiums but I love that shit you know I love I love the energy um, of those things that people can kind of collectively rally around Um, and so I'm watching this promo and it kind of just gives me like a flashback to like when I shot the Chili's gig in 2022 I'm like yeah, you know what? I should probably really shoot this concert. <laughs> I should probably really try to get a photo pass for this concert. I'm gonna see. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. But I would. I, I think it's like this will probably be really fun. I'll go into it cynical and guarded, but it'll be really fun. That's awesome. That's that's killer. And uh, a perfect segue uh, to something that was in my notes. I wanted to. You shot. Um, you shot the Errors tour when they were. In I Philly? shot the Errors tour. Yeah. Philly, right? <laughs> How Another... fucking insane was that? <laughs> completely bonkers. Um, completely bonkers tour. Um. Because, I mean, that was even more people. That was the link. So that was like, what, like 70,000 or something? Like 60 or 70,000? Like the Citizens Bank Park, I think, is 45 or 50,000. There's a lot of people. Like, that, that's like that's like three Wells Fargo centers, you know? Like, that's, that's insane. And, um, like, the actual shooting of it was, you're just, like, in that, like, photo trench. And, like, the show starts... And you're kind of trying to get your bearings and get your like light metering and like making sure everything is looking good. And then Taylor, you know, Taylor comes up on stage, like the riser comes up, and it's like, all right, I'm just gonna shoot a shitload of pictures and hope that something turns out good because I only have like two and a half songs right now. And uh, so it's kind of like a blur. And um, uh, for me, kind of like the real work is like more in the editing and like the kind of not editing in the sense of like going through and, like, manipulating pictures that are just okay to, like, look better and more just, like, here's seven pictures that kind of are all of Taylor on this catwalk doing this pose, which is the one that I think is the strongest one to kind of tell the story. And that's, for me, like, it's the harder part, but it's also one that I think I've gotten, like, decently okay at over the years. So uh, for me, that's more of, like, the less the actual capture and more, like, the looking at the capture, like, the stuff I captured post and, like arranging it to tell the story but yeah it was like yeah there was there was probably like 40 of us uh my friend lisa schaefer was was shooting as well um a bunch of people from like ap and like people who had like driven in from like other uh like other neighboring states to cover this like and um you know we had like uh i mean technically it was like three songs but two of the songs were like a medley like uh miss americana went into Cruel Summer, like it wasn't a full version of each. So it was kind of like a song and a half and then the third song, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, which is fine because I got no shortage of pictures, you know. It was, I, I, it was perfect. Um, and, then, uh, and then they kind of, as soon as um, that last song that we shot, I think it was I'm the Man was the third one because it started off on the lover section of the show. Um, as soon as I'm the man was done, the person, the press liaison person was like, all right, camera's down, let's go. And they zipped us out. And it was just like, oh, okay, cool. All right, bye. <laughs> and then, um, uh, like, they took us out through this, um, uh, like, the area of the Met that is, or not the Met, the Link, excuse me, the area of the Link that is, uh, like, I don't know if it's, like, a, a VIP lounge or what, but it wasn't being used. And that was kind of, like, the staging area for press. And, like, they, they took us out. We had to give back our badges because they had these huge, ostentatious, like, press badges that we thought we were going to get to keep, uh, but we didn't. And I think I think that has something to do with, like, there's, like, four or five different versions of them, and they switched them up from night to night. So that way you can't take a press badge from a previous night and show up at, the, you know, I think, don't quote me on that. But I think that's what why we all had to give them back. I'm like, this is awesome. I wanted to keep this. It's like a, anyway. Um, so like we, they kind of ushered us out the side of the net. I went back to the XPN van, dropped off my camera, and then rushed back in uh, to because um, uh, they gave us press tickets too. So I went out to meet Maureen at our seats, and uh, by that point she was in like the fearless section of the set, and 
she had just come out to like the far end of the catwalk and where we were sitting was like the back of the field so we thought that like oh we're she's going to be all the way up there like these seats aren't really going to be close we're going to be more looking at the screens but then the catwalk extended in such a way that like when she came to the end of the catwalk she was like right there and like oh, and again and again, like talking about like there was like maybe like three or four rows of people in front of us and then the end of the catwalk. And again, talking about that like kind of collective energy thing, like when she's like walking out and dancing and when the people in front of us could tell that she was approaching the, our side of the catwalk, just like the eruption in just like people screaming and cheering like, oh, my God, and like pulling up their phones and getting videos. I was like, this is wild and awesome. I don't know. I loved it. That's the coolest. That is so cool. Yeah, I couldn't even imagine like what like the team that has to put all of that together. Like even even just the function of getting uh you know you guys in and out. Like the yeah. kind of clockwork and how they have it down. Like like it's like it's like it's nothing to them. You know what I mean? Like it's wild. Yeah. And then like I mean I guess it the the the, the difference is to um that they were doing multiple nights in each city versus like. Like doing Philly and then doing like DC the next day and then doing Atlanta the next day or whatever. Like they 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 come to the city, they settle in, they do a three night run, then they have a few days off and then they go to the next city. And those few days off is basically, I think, them their crew transporting the entire freaking thing to wherever it is next. Because it's like one of the funnier things uh, that I I think from a you know commerce perspective is freaking brilliant. Um, so my sister is a big Taylor fan. I, I don't want to call her a Swifty because that's like there's negative connotations with that word. But Elaine loves Taylor, and um, she went down on Thursday. So if you remember, the Eras tour was Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Philly. And Thursday, the truck started coming in with like the stage set up, and in the midst of that was the merch truck. So like they 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 drove in the merch truck on Thursday, opened it up, and people including Elaine, were in the parking lot, like, lined up and waiting to buy merch. Like, for like rather than trying to buy it at the show itself. I'm like, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. You are making so much money right now. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, back to the, the station, uh, tying... Uh, uh, look at me, king of segues. Um, uh, <laughs> one of my favorite things uh, that has happened in um, probably the last decade um, was uh, uh, all too well the 10 minute version making the um the top uh, uh forget what place it came in but like uh me and my pals we were put, we were uh kind of we we put a little campaign together trying to, to oh, force yeah. everyone <laughs> like we, we everybody we knew that we were voting we were like hey can you just uh, pretty high up on your ballot put in all too well 10 minute version taylor's version and make sure it's that version <laughs> because and the reaction um, from the community when it played was so w all in or all out, and it was just mm. my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I feel like, I mean, she was in that countdown in the eight hundred eighty five, like more than most artists. Like she was all over, and I think that was really cool to see. Like that, you know. Whereas ten years ago, we would. I remember like 10 years ago, like one of our uh, former photographers, uh, Rachel, shot the uh, 1989 tour and uh, did an amazing job of it. We posted a review and the XPN uh, 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 Facebook audience was so mean about the fact that we were even at this show. Um, and I think it's cool to see like, you know, 10 years later that people are kind of like, no, Taylor is awesome. Is Taylor's great. She has a whole lot of amazing songs and a vast catalog <laughs> it's, um, it, it's weird to me how polarizing she is um mm. because like she's such an effective songwriter that mm. like i don't understand like what there is to hate and, and i understand mm. overexposure uh, affects everybody mm. different ways but like it's 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 beyond me that anybody uses the word like talentless when they when they yeah. are just slinging things and i'm like where are you coming from <laughs> You know, I, I attribute that a lot um, to, like, and, and again, like, with the older guard of XPN members, um, like, we, like, in the, back in the day, in, like, the late 90s and early 2000s, like, our, uh, m like, the way we kind of presented the station was, you know, we're an alternative to what's going on in Top 40 Radio. We're, pl we're the place where you're going to hear the artists that you're not hearing elsewhere on the radio. And we're the place that you're hearing artists for the first time that you will then hear a lot more of years later. Like, we're the first place you're hearing Nelly Furtado. We're the first place you're hearing Adele, whatever. Um, 
And we are still that, I think. XPN is still that. But um, at the time, we definitely, from a marketing standpoint, leaned into the, like, we have a bumper sticker on our studio wall downstairs that says, life's too short for top 40. <laughs> and um, that was kind of like one of our mantras for, like, years. And, like, I think a lot of the audience who's having that adverse reaction are folks who bought into that very literally and then feel betrayed that we're then playing. Whereas like everybody here, all the hosts are like, we're just people who love music and all sorts of music and we're playing it for you. (laughs) And yes, of course we're going to play popular music because we want to bring in like, you know, a large range of listeners and then we're going to play deep cuts too. Like it's, it's, that's what we do. Um, but yeah, I think that like the, ad, like the negative reaction you see maybe stems a little bit from that was from the fact that like for the longest time we didn't do that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and no, I, I like I get it, too. Like, you know, like I, I, I have um, uh, a uh, uh, old hater bones in me that I have been trying to quiet uh, for the past few years, post pandemic, mostly mm. um, where, I, you know, and that's kind of what the birthplace of this whole podcast and website was all about was like um, I had become so jaded and cynical that like mm. I wanted to actively change that. And so um, and, and and that's what I've been trying to do. And one of the things that has really been exciting me about the growth of the station and and kind of like you know the 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 newer blood coming through and stuff like that but even like you know um even, even like uh Bruce and Dan uh, you know is that like it has evolved into just a place that that champions music period that there isn't right. you know some kind of like parameter of you know the the fact that like uh uh, uh John's uh Culture Cypher Radio is now a weekly show, you know, things mm-hmm. like that, like absolutely excites me and uh, Rhythm Lab, you know, um, on, mm-hmm. on Mondays and whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. I get really excited um, when people like things that that and don't exclude things you know trying to be something and Mm -hmm. but mostly because that was me like like it's like it's like the station's growing i'm growing we're all growing like and 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 i like the fact that you know that 88.5 countdown of women i thought was probably my favorite countdown uh that Mm -hmm. the station has done and and mostly because there it what it it showed to me was that this this argument that a lot of people have that like you know um uh you know uh, that like Phoebe Bridgers kind of talked about it at the Grammys like that, right. that women need to try harder or whatnot like there was eight hundred and eighty five reasons why that concept is bullshit and and yeah. I love it and I love yeah. it and I love what the station's doing now hell yeah thank you man thank you um and yeah I I love that we're a space where like. You can hear, for instance, like I go back to Adele for an example. Like we played uh, Hello like immediately right away when that single came out. But then we would also be playing like indie rock, like local natives or something. Yeah. Who's not at that same level of like mass popularity. And then I was probably playing like early stuff from Hopalong at that point, too, Uh, because at that point I was I was definitely on the local show. Um, and uh, sharing the radio, uh, Helen would do an hour and I would do an hour. Um, so, like, it, it, I love one place that you can hear all of those things instead of um, instead of one place where you're going to hear the same 20 things over and over uh, and over. And then also, this came up during the conversations around the 885 Greatest Songs by Women countdown um, as we were kind of like... Uh, we, we we saw the votes come in and we saw what the list was going to be and we're kind of like sourcing the songs that we didn't already have loading in the library and all that behind the scenes production stuff. We, we realized that like this list was covering, I, I guess it would be like seven or eight decades of music, like 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and 2020s. That's eight. And then I think we might have even have song, might have had songs in there that went back to like the 40s. Like, like, you know, so it's just like it, we're, we're a station that plays like, uh, let's just say it's like eight, like eight decades of music. That is wild. Yeah, so. it was beautiful. And like, uh, even though like I'm still I'm still bitter because, um, mm. look, the fact that um, uh, Be My Baby came in at like 142. 
Like, get mm-hmm. out of here. Like, I, I want to find mm-hmm. every single person who voted and didn't vote for Be My Baby being uh, number one. And I, and I want to <laughs> fight them uh, because that oh, was man. my number one pick. But <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 142. Get out of here. <laughs> um, but no, like, uh, like uh, y- you mentioned uh, the local show. Um, mm-hmm. that's, that's another thing that I think, um, and, and you are a, a big driver of this, um, and, you know, like Helen and, and, and Mike, uh, you know, now, um, uh, big champions of the local scene. And I feel like, um, you've kind of, you know, there used to be like, um, Jackson's local shots on MMR, you know, Y100 right. before that and stuff like that. I feel like you mm-hmm. guys are like the last bastion of like championing this scene and it, and uh and it's working out mutually because like I feel like this scene right now is quite literally the strongest I've ever seen it in my life like and mostly because there used to kind of be an edge I feel like to the scene where everybody was kind of out for themselves. Whereas Mm. now I feel like uh, across genre, everybody is just propping everybody else up and it's a beautiful thing to see. I I 100% agree. Like there was so much when I, so I, um, when I got out of college in 2002, um, my first like real music related gig was I wrote for the city paper and um, I had had an intern there. Uh, in, I had I'd had an internship there uh, under the music editor at the time, Pat Rappa, and he gave me a lot of opportunity. First, for just like write about records that you like, write about shows that you're excited about, and then uh, every six months they would have a local music issue. Um, it might have even been quarterly, but it was like some like recurring interval. Like every every blank x times a year, City Paper would do its music issue. And uh, the first time I got to take part in that, you know, Pat was like, yeah, you know, you just like what local bands are you excited about? Like, give me some pitches and I'll give you an assignment and you'll get to interview them. And so I did. And it was like my first real experience writing about like long form about local artists. And um, and it was cool. So I just did more of that and kind of became more enmeshed in the scene. And at that time, um, yeah, it was like not like I mean, I guess it was like relatively I, I would I would hesitate to call it cutthroat, but it was definitely competitive. Mm-hmm. And scene still scene scene is still competitive today, but I feel like there was a lot less warmth back then. Like bands would share bills together at like the Kyber, for instance, and then one of them might land on a tour, and they might you know get a label deal where the other one who they had just gigged with six months before is still playing the Kyber, and they'd be like, "What the bl-? like a lot of resentment around like that sort of thing." And it was just, like, stupid. And, like, I think, I mean, I get it from, like, a working musician's perspective. Like, why didn't I take off like that? And, like, sometimes it's just, like, a lot of, like, right place, right time, like, right ability to, like, network and schmooze your way into, like, the industry uh, sort of thing. But I feel like now there's more of, like, a, you know, people, like, Philly musicians look at Philly and they're like, Mannequin Pussy's blowing up. Fuck yeah, I love Mannequin Pussy, you know? Um... Or, you know, n- insert musician here. Like, there, there's, like, like Sweet Pill. Like, people will rally around these bands and artists and singers and whatever because, uh, you know, they're stoked to see folks from, from Philly kind of get national attention and love. Um, I, think, I think, you know, MMR still sort of um, does uh, stuff with local folks. I know that my friend Sarah um, is a host there. And uh, she worked with uh, Jackson for a while. Now, who was it? Did Jackson retire? There was like a bunch of layoffs or something a year ago. It was the and layoffs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so like that sort of ended what Sarah was working on at that time as far as like the local stuff that they were doing. But then I feel like she still pops up here and there like championing local folks through um through them and like you know she's turned me on to a lot of artists like that um there's a hard rock band from like north jersey uh called soraya that like i never would have heard of had sarah not been like dude you should check this band out they're really great so like they do they are looking out there but there's not a lot of other places on like the commercial dial that really do katie definitely does but they're a college station mm-hmm. um I don't know that PR how much PRB really plays local music. They used to. There was a point where they used to, but I feel like yeah, it's like us, KDU, 
NMR to an extent, and uh, RTI does a lot with local jazz artists. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and like, uh, um, not like I, uh, one of the other things, you know, and you, you know, we've kind of touched upon it, but like, I think bringing these artists in on the key and then that kind of ending up on, you know, cause that, that ends up on NPR then, you know, on, mm. on the NPR site. And I feel like, you know, it's just, you, you, you've guys have pre- created this kind of, um, this, uh, infrastructure, um, to be able to not just kind of champion people, um, for the for the listener base in the area, but like mm. nationally, like you know, it, it's it's putting the spotlight on on you know some bands like like our our, our pals the Tisberries, like is yeah. a, a key example, you know, like um and and per giving them an opportunity to kind of um reach new ears that they never would have any other way. It's been really fun to like both work with those artists and then like see those artists get opportunities, like in the wake of us doing and I would never go so far as to like take credit for any of that stuff but I've been told by more than a few musicians that like having those videos helps them when they're going out to do their next thing like um I've heard um you know Danielle from the band Grocer told me after they did a live session with us they actually did one uh during our pandemic lockdown series where we were going out and just shooting live sessions at like various places around Philly. Uh, our friend Matt Shank was doing mobile sound. It was like a whole vibe. It was fun. Uh, they were called the unprecedented sessions. Uh, but Danielle told me that like when they went to book their first post lockdown tour, they would send all the venues like here, look at this video uh, to see what, um, what our live show is like. And they were able to kind of like connect dots between certain cities that they were playing on the road, like on the strength of like, like promoters being like, yeah, this looks cool. I would love to book you, you know? So like, I love hearing shit like that because it's like, like a lot of times it's like, I'm producing it. I'm putting stuff up in my show. I'm putting stuff on the web. I'm like, I hope this is reaching people. And like, you know, you see the numbers to know that it is, but then to hear like the actual practical, like this is helping me. And like, here's how it's like, it, it, it kind of makes me feel like, yeah, no, I do have a purpose. This is great. <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. And it's so admirable. And, and like, uh, seriously, like, I, I think uh, the, the work you guys do is um, so, so incredible. Um, Thank you. Um, so here's, here's a question that uh, I, I want to ask. Um, because you are, are so entrenched in, in Philly Local and stuff like that, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a two-part question. First, um, who's the band uh, who excites you the most? Uh, locally right now and um, two who's the band um, that you can't believe didn't blow up that maybe doesn't even do it anymore okay band that excites me the most right now uh, and still has yet to release their first like single to streaming services Uh, so uh, I'm a little like I really hope this band does something I know that they're working on something they're called Cold Court um, and I saw them play Last fall, um, it was at the DIY Super Bowl event that the 4333 Collective put on every year. It was at the Yuki Club. And they were kind of like, they had done some shows for 4333 in the past. And I think like that that whole crew of people um, that book stuff, um, like they very much to me feel like they're doing now what R5 Productions was doing in like 2002, 2003, as far as like like nurturing like a, a, a the DIY scene. And R5 is obviously still active and still doing that. But like I like how they're able to exist in like this complementary way, and like them kind of bringing in like a new generation and a new audience, et cetera, et cetera. So um, 43 very intentional about like booking local folks in the mix of all the other stuff they book too. And um, DIY Super Bowl is this thing they do every year. And and I think it was mostly local this year. Um, but, like, they kind of gave this band that they were really excited about, Cold Court, this, like, plum, like, center spot on the bill. So it's a five-band bill, and they were playing third out of five. So it was, like, the point in the show where you know everyone's going to be there and no one's left yet, you know? And so it was, like, a perfect storm of, like, excitement and energy. And they they get up there. I think it was like five or six people, um, and I liken them to, like my my takeaway from the set is like, wow, this is like at the drive-in, mixed with like early Santana, like oh, okay. the jamminess of early Santana, but like the kind of like not wanky jamminess, like the more atmospheric psychedelia sort of thing. Um, 
and then like it would kind of kick into these more like angular aggressive like fluid like punk hardcore passages um and they were just really really rad like they had somebody who was doing like 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 conga percussion and like like keys and like a couple guitars they had a sax player it was it was a really really wild show and definitely like one of the best um like first impressions i got from a band last year and they're all still very young they're like i believe drexel students for the most part and then i think some of them might still be like late teens like not in college yet um but they um they've gotten some good opportunities at, like outside of that one gig like they opened up for black midi at the first or at union transfer excuse me um and from when i've talked to the band they're working on recording their first singles that are going to come out sometime this year and i know they're like very intentionally kind of trying to like get their music out there and like i think they have a manager they're working with which is always good um and uh I, I'm just really kind of excited to see what they do, like what their stuff sounds like when it's, um, when it's like, you know, when it's not live and when there's not the thrill of like, like 300 people kind of like just focused and locked in when it's like you're alone and listening on your headphones, does it still have that same energy? And I'm kind of optimistic that it will, um, but I'm really excited to see what they end up doing with it. And then a um, uh, band that I wish had blown up and had not, is a band called East 100. Do you remember them? It sounds really familiar. Okay, East 100 um, was a indie slash modern rock band in like 2008, 2009, 2010. I think they broke up around 2012 or 13. Um, but when I started volunteering at XPN, before I was, before I was here full-time, before I was here part-time, before I was like getting paid to be here, I was a volunteer. Um, I came on at the same time as uh, Joey O. We were both part of the the Y Rock on XPN kind of family, and um, East Hundred was one of the first bands that like we as a collective really kind of got behind. Um, it was like 2009, and they were uh, a little bit synthy, a little bit like jangly guitar rock. Uh, my go-to reference point for them is Metric. Um, okay. The singer Burrell, uh, she is just like a powerhouse vocalist, and they made these really, really just great songs. And like some of them were more like spooky and atmospheric and dark, and some of them were just like pop bangers. Um, and they played Noncom one year. They played uh, the festival. Um, they made some records with Brian McTeer at Minor Street, um, and they were very committed to like kind of. DIYing it as much as they could like they did all their own press um, they self-released they didn't really chase labels and then um, or maybe they did chase labels and they were just having a hard time like a hard go of it so they were like fuck it we're gonna do this on our own but they're a band that like if the industry had kind of gotten behind them in the right way they probably could have been huge they were like super charismatic they made great music they were great people um, and then I think like the whole going it alone kind of just like got to them after a while and they're like, you know what, we're really proud of the music that we made and we're still friends and we're grateful for our time together and we kind of want to leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but the, the, the two brothers that were in the band, um, uh, uh, Will the drummer and Brooke the guitarist, uh, are now, uh, film score. They do film scores under uh the blair brothers they do like horror movies like the movie uh green room i don't know if you're familiar with that movie but like they did the score for that movie and uh they've done a lot of other so that's kind of like their bread and butter these days and i think they're kind of like yeah you know what we're just going to do this thing where we're still working in music but we're having a lot more success and it's probably like a lot more creatively fulfilling knowing that like you're putting your heart and soul into this work and it's reaching people um but they were no they were such a good band and i uh, like my my friend um my, my friend and local predecessor uh Jake uh Jake Rabbit slash Jake Neisenfeld, uh he did the local show for Y Rock when I first came on. Um and he and I kind of started working together on what would become uh the key uh studio sessions. And uh Jake and I, like, it's still like our go to reference point for like who should have blown up and didn't East Hundred for sure. 
That's awesome. I'm gonna have to look it up. Like that name sounds really familiar, and I'm I'm gonna I'm probably going to recognize it when I hear it. But um, mm. yeah, their song "Slow Burning Crimes" is a good place to start. All right, all right. I like it. I like it. At this time, you want to go through the jauntlet? This is my questionnaire. I ask all the of my jauntlet. guests. The uh, It starts it. with the one hit wonders. Uh, okay. First one: Billy Joel or Elton John? Who do you prefer? If I'm being honest, Billy Joel. I know that man's catalog, unfortunately by heart. And fortunately, I think he writes great songs. Um, and I've only more recently kind of gotten into Elton John. Uh, but no, Billy Joel I grew up on. Um, we saw, Maureen and I saw him last year at the link, and that was like a two-hour, 15-minute singing along to every song because it's, like, it's just like in my bones. Like He's another artist that I got from, from my mother, would play me Billy Joel as a kid, and it kind of stuck with me. Yeah, Billy Joel's one of those guys who, like, uh, when people tell me they don't like him, and then, like, I just start playing songs, and I go, oh, well, I like this. And it's like, oh, well, yeah. I like, And I'm like, yeah, I know you do. Like, <laughs> I mean, he's got some cheesy songs, for sure. Um, mm-hmm. But, like, the new song the new song that he put out, um, so when we're at the point that we've recorded this for listeners, uh, just last week, Billy Joel released his first uh, new song in, like, 17 years. It's pretty good. It's pre- I mean, it's like, it, it, it feels like he's trying to do, like, Summer Highland Falls, and it's not as good as when he did Summer Highland Falls in the 70s, but it's in that spirit, and I like it. Um, but yeah, <laughs> Maureen and I were talking about it, and I was like, yeah, it's a ballad. And she's like, oh, so is it like, uh, this is the time? And I'm like, no, it's a good ballad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, my favorite Billy Joel fact uh, and, uh, uh, you know, keeping it in Philadelphia, and you probably know this, but maybe you don't, Mm -hmm. is that um, Chuck Treese played bass on River of Dreams. I did not know that. Whoa. (laughs) Chuck Treese is amazing. Yeah. And what's wild about that is the way I found out about it was, I want to say it was like an interview with like the Metro. Like I was, all I remember is I read it when I was on the train and he was talking Mm -hmm. about he was in Dorney Park. Uh, with uh, and, and I'm going to guess it was Kieran uh, with his kid. And, mm. and in the article, he's like, you know, and it, the River of Dreams comes on over the loudspeaker. And I tell him, you know, that's me playing bass. And my kid was like, so. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's yeah, Chuck, Chuck is uh, one of those people who I have been um, for three years trying to schedule an interview. And we've gone as far as to um, uh, 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 sit down at one point and he couldn't connect to uh, his Wi-Fi. And so mm-hmm. he was like, we were like, oh, we'll do it tomorrow. And then every single time something comes up and it falls through. So he's uh-huh. he's become my uh, he, like the Matt Damon to my uh, Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it comes through though at some point. It will. Um and and he's just incredible. Like he is so connected to so many um and I don't mean like oh he's so connected in like a kind of skeezy industry way. He just is a super talented person who has played with everybody and it's like you could draw like a Chuck Trees like uh what's it called? Um I don't know what the name of that diagram is, but like where it's just kind of like branching out to like different like, oh, he's like Chuck Treese worked with this person, with this person, with this, you know, and, and in Philly and beyond. He's no, he's awesome. Yeah, I'm big. Uh, like and like it's so funny because I actually we it, again, uh, people listening, this is uh, in the past, but um, I just saw uh, him uh, playing with uh, G Love like two weeks ago and um, I was backstage and I was going to corner him to um, uh, set up this interview and he literally mm. was like, hey, what's up? And he took off and I was like, God damn it. But was another the, guy the... from Ambler. He's he's uh. living in Ambler. So, like ah. Uh. That's amazing. Yeah, was that that one of those city winery shows? Yeah, the the Friday night show. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Um, I'm sorry if this killer. John. I'm sorry if the jauntlet is supposed to be more like rapid fire, and I'm like being long winded about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it never is. It, it was originally designed that way, and uh, I gave up thinking mm. that um, because I, I go off on these side tangents w- and bring up topics that aren't even a part of it, and then I, and then mm. I forget what I'm doing. Uh, but thanks for reminding me. Uh, number two, Debbie Harry or Joan Jett? <laughs> oh, man. Um, Joan Jett is such a badass, but I'm going to go with Debbie Harry just because seeing Blondie at Noncom and then seeing them at Exponential was just like, man, like Debbie and this band are such a force, and... Um, and it, and they're similar to Billy Joel where it's like, this music is kind of like in my psyche. Like I just had so many Blondie songs in rotation, more so in college. I think I kind of came to them a little bit later. Um, like when I finally decided to like listen deeper than heart, heart of glass, I'm like, oh shit, this band has great, 
great, great song. Like I, 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 I definitely gravitate more towards Blondie um, and Debbie. So I dig for it. Sure, I dig it. Uh, Aretha Franklin or Tina Turner? Aretha, because um, the Amazing Grace documentary. Have you have you watched that? Uh, I have. It's it's in my queue, and I still haven't gotten a chance to sit down and do it. It is wow. Like it's. I mean. Yeah, it, it, it just kind of hearing her returning from the you know quote unquote secular music world to singing gospel music again, and then like hearing it so like like I mean she is obviously like the featured vocalist in this 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 concert, but she's also like part of the bigger ensemble, and it's just like so powerful. And I, I'm not like the most religious person ever, but it's like so powerful and moving and like. Wow, it definitely definitely worth a watch with a good sound system in place. <laughs> Dig it. I, I, I'll move it. I'm moving it up on the queue as we speak. Uh, uh, the next one, uh, Nirvana or Pearl Jam? I'm sorry to keep going with number one in your options, but Nirvana. Um, and uh, back in the uh, to kind of take it back to like the bootleg conversation from earlier. Um, so yeah, 1993, 1994, me was all about Nine Inch Nails and Nirvana. And um, I guess kind of in the wake of Kurt's passing in 94, uh, 30 years ago, which is wild, um, uh, there was kind of like an uptick in like tape trading. And I was on Prodigy at the time. Um, and <laughs> and uh, I was like 14 or whatever. Um, and uh, uh, 14 or 15. I'm 45 now. So I'd been you know, 14 or 15. And like going on like alt music nirvana and like wanting to basically this started because i wanted to learn nirvana songs on guitar and people were referencing all these other nirvana songs that i had never heard like what is uh sappy what is spank through and then uh so people were like oh well you can take trade you know and i'm like what does that even mean and so i I remember it started with getting, I forget what I traded or if I just paid the person to get this like Nirvana in Milan in February of 1994, terrible quality uh, audience recorded bootleg. Uh, And that was my first bootleg cassette and my first Nirvana bootleg. And then, like, you know, tape trading is like, well, what do you got that I, could, I don't have? Oh, you have this Milan tape. I'll trade you this Milan tape for this rarities compilation. And then, like, oh, you have two tapes that you can trade now. And it kind of just builds and snowballs from there. So... I think at one point I had upwards to like a hundred Nirvana tapes, um, and then I realized that I don't need all these. Like, uh, uh, maybe a hundred is an exaggeration. Maybe it was more like seventy, but it was a lot. It was definitely in the higher double digits. And then I realized I kind of don't need all these like questionable sound quality, questionable performance quality uh, 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 tapes. It, like when I kind of wound down on the tape trading thing, uh, so I condensed it and now i think i have like 20 to 25 ish and they're like the the shows that i would actually return to and listen to more than once you know so it was like this recording of them playing in tacoma washington in 1987 like that's pretty cool like this recording of them playing in st petersburg florida in november of 93 this is really good and it's insanely good quality and it's like kurt cobain like kind of in the throes of his like you know, what he was going through at that time of his life, uh, but still at that particular gig being warm and funny and outgoing and, like, a side of him that, like, you don't really see because either it wasn't the narrative the press wanted to tell or it was just, like, not how he was at that time. And it's like, this is fun, Kurt. I like this. Like, I will never get rid of this tape. So it was, like, like the ones that kind of I would come back to for whatever. The trick-or-treat one was another one. Um, So, yeah, Nirvana for sure. Um, is, Sorry, I give such long answers. <laughs> I love it. No, I love it. Um, what are the chances of us uh, getting some of that on? What, what's the frequency? Oh, the bootlegs? You know what? <laughs> Maybe, because I am planning something. I do not know what yet for, uh, for to mark the anniversary of his passing in April. Um, and maybe some of it might be live. But also, I, I for the longest time, I, like, didn't play unofficial stuff. Like, I would only play, like, albums and B-sides and things that were, like, properly released. And I did break that recently for the first time um, in January of 2024. Every January, what's the frequency would fall? When I was doing it monthly, it would fall during Philly Loves Bowie Week. 
And so um, I was like, what can I do this year that's a variation on 90s Bowie that I haven't already done? And um, it wound up being like, like Maureen gave me this recording she had like late last year. Uh, she was like, oh, you didn't hear this uh, this tour that they did without uh, Nine Inch Nails? I'm like, oh, I was aware of it. I just didn't go because I was a cranky Nine Inch Nails fan who didn't want him playing to like big audiences and like I felt like he had sold out so like and she was like you should listen to this it's a really good bootleg so like I listened to it and it's like this soundboard ass recording of like this amazing uh, like so alright Tangent do you remember that tour the the Bowie Nails outside tour I, I didn't go but I remember I do remember that tour yeah okay so this is I was not aware until Maureen gave me this this recording that this is the format of that tour instead of Opening band, which was Prick, I think, and then a break, and then Nine Inch Nails, and then a break, and then David Bowie. Um, you know, the the Prick played, then there was like whatever, and then Nails got on stage, and they played like a 45, 50 minute ish set. And then at some point towards the end of their set, members of David Bowie's band, and then David Bowie himself came out on stage, and they did like five or six songs together. Half of them are Bowie songs. And then half of them are Nine Inch Nails songs. And then Nine Inch Nails exited and Bowie took the, took the show from there and played the rest of it. And I'm like, that's awesome. Like that, I, I'm i like, why did I not go to this tour? And then like his set list, like the Bowie set list was like really, really good. Like they closed on, um, on this particular recording, they closed on um, Teenage Wildlife, which I think is from Scary Monsters. I'm like, this song is amazing. Like, uh, so yeah, like I, I wish I had uh, gone to that tour did this all stem from nirvana versus pearl jam by the way certainly did <laughs> i'm sorry nate <laughs> don't right, ever John apologize Lit. that's it ba- uh, back on the, the John Lit. janice joplin or stevie nicks stevie nicks all right second one hell yeah um i like janice uh i think i like stevie's songs more um and i think of the songs in the fleetwood mac songbook the best ones are stevie's um, and then I saw Stevie last year at that, it was that, that Billy Joel show. It was like Billy Joel and Stevie Nicks and like Stevie's set was as good. If not, I would, I don't know that I would go so far as to say better than Billy Joel. I think they were equally good. Maureen definitely thought Stevie Nicks was better. Um, and, uh, I respect that. <laughs> That's awesome. We, uh, it, we, we I'm, I'm part of the, um, um, uh, XP Zennial caucus, uh, shout out mm. to our friends. Um, yep, yep. but, um, uh, they, uh, we, we, um, hyper-focused and, and, uh, have all, uh, talked about, um, the, uh, 97, uh, performance of Silver Springs, how it's like the, the, gr- one of the greatest moments ever, which is the, you know, Stevie Nicks staring down Lindsey Buckingham while singing it on stage. It's just the, it's, the most amazing thing in the world and, and that's that's the one that's been like memed of like yeah 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 and <laughs> now they're awesome. like selling shirts of it it's great i love it <laughs> uh beatles or the stones if i'm being honest the beatles um i definitely probably like other bands of that era more uh why is the Velvet Underground never in that question you know what i mean but like i mean i, I also i get it <laughs> I, 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 Beatles, another band I got from my mom. And, um, I think because of that, I always associate them with childhood. And, um, and not to say that the Beatles didn't make great songs because they certainly did. Um, made amazing songs, amazing records. Uh, but also I kind of am like, uh, why, 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 why are we still talking about the Beatles? But then I'm like, oh, right, because they're awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, no, I definitely get it. I actually was, I don't even remember who I was talking to about this recently, but I was saying that, like, uh, the, the, I, I don't know, it's it's the Sgt. Pepper's thing, right? Like, I don't know that people vote Sgt. Pepper's anymore as the best album ever, or if they're just like, well, I have to say that because that's what we say. You know what I mean? Like, mm. so, like, it, it, I wonder, like, you know, and and look, all right, I, I'm, I'm not taking away from from everything they d- did musically and, and right. you know, they changed music right but yeah. like how many people are really like now nah, let me let me put on the beatles you know like mm. that that say that they love the beatles you know what i mean but then also how many people are going to be somewhere where the beatles comes on and they're going to be like let's change this you know right, right. 
So it's kind of like this, this, you know, and I think to your point about like the Sgt. Pepper thing, it's like, I think that this is something we see a lot in like the voting for uh, top whatever's songs, albums, um, is kind of like the, like sometimes there is like universal consensus, like, you know, um, with the 885 greatest songs by women, it was like, you know, far and away. You know, the top 10 were the top 10. You know what I mean? But then sometimes um, it's like, and I I find this more with like when I'm working with my writers or whatever on like albums of the year. Sometimes it's like people will, like an album will rank very high. uh, And I don't want to name names because I like the artists too much to (laughs) whatever. But like an album may rank very high, but nobody had it at like their number one or their number two. It was like a lot of people's number seven, number eight, but because it was a lot of people's, it kind of bumped it up in the thing uh, versus, uh, but then on the other side, sometimes uh, one album being one person's number one will push it higher than, you know, whatever. So anyway, there's, the, the consensus is weird. That's the yeah. that's the point I'm trying to make there. <laughs> I get it. No, it's true. And you know, like uh, um, uh, it, it's very weird because uh, uh, every album of the year list that I saw, including your guys, uh, clearly missed the boat because none of them had what was my number one album of the year, which was After Hours by Ali and AJ. But anyway, I digress. Mm. <laughs> it's a really good album. I don't. Well. Okay. I, I do not know that one. So, uh, Allie and AJ uh, uh, Machalka are uh, the act- Disney Channel actresses, and they put this oh. album out after hours, and it's really good. Um, okay, cool. It's a vibe. Check it out. Uh, the last oh, yeah. one of the one-hit wonders, Bohemian Rhapsody or Stairway to Heaven? Bohemian Rhapsody. Just yeah. on the vocals alone, plus like the this, like the Wayne's World adjacent nostalgia. You know, like I. I so in my concert fo- fo- photography, I go to um, at least when they still had it. Hopefully, they bring it back. But um, the Firefly Festival always really fun to go to in Delaware. And um, uh, the last one I went to, Green Day headline one of the days, and their whole thing to like get the crowd like hyped up before they take the stage is they play like like the schlockiest classic rock stuff uh so uh to kind of and but it's stuff that like people know all the words to and know all like the melodies too so it's like they're playing like seven nation army or like smells like teen spirit or whatever and they play bohemian rhapsody and without prompts everybody starts singing along and doing all like the wayne's world gestures and stuff and then when it comes to like the crescendo Everybody just again without prompt knows to start headbanging, and it's like I love that it kind of took on a life of its own, like that. What a decade and a half after it was actually released, and that it still has that life. It's it's wild. It's like a it's a phenomenon, and it's a great song. Yeah, it's that's it's pure magic. Like uh, I, I tell people about this a lot, but um, one of my favorite memories at a live show ever um, wasn't even like really a performance. It was something similar to that, and it was. Um, uh, did you go to Live Eight? No, no. I remember the the summer that it happened because I remember I was down on the Parkway uh, like a month beforehand because I think the fireworks concert that year was at Elton John. Yes. Um, yeah. Taking it back to Elton. Uh, didn't get into him till later, but like I saw that concert and I remember being aware of Live 8 and not going because I think I had the not greatest experience biking down the parkway to go to that show. But anyway. But so uh, Will Smith was the MC of the event. Mm. And uh, Jeff was there um, uh, and, and doing like interludes and stuff like that. And mm. at one point he was like, you know, I think there's like supposed to be there's reportedly a million people here and I just mm. want to test something out. And he just goes in West Philadelphia, born and raised. And then uh-huh. a million people wrapped the theme song of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air um, uh, unassisted. Amazing. And it was one of the most <laughs> amazing things I've ever seen in my life. Like I couldn't imagine like creating something and then being like, OK, a million people go. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's cool. It's super cool. Uh, the next section, the top 10 countdown, of course, you know, John can be whatever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be music. Uh, number one, what was your first John? What was the first thing you were obsessed with as a kid? Star Wars. Same. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, uh, I have pictures of me wearing like sheets of brown cloth kind of tied over my head as though I were uh, Luke Skywalker in the beginning of um, uh, Jedi. Like the hood, the hoodie cape thing. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Um, loved it. So much fun. Still love it. So much fun. Last night before uh, uh, my wife and I went to the Mitski concert last night, uh, we stopped at um, Prohibition Tap Room and they were showing the trilogy on the TVs for whatever reason. And it was just like, oh my God, like, do we want to stay here and like watch like a little bit more? And then like, um, it got to the end of A New Hope and like the way the Death Star exploded with like the ring going out was like, okay, these are the special editions. These are like the not original versions, whatever. Uh, but still cool. Still love it. It's, it's, I love that. I love that. Uh, and, and you, you know, you're saying that to a guy who uh, got married dressed as Han Solo. Uh, oh to my a woman God. Dressed as Princess Leia. So, uh, oh my yeah. God. <laughs> You're, yeah. you're in good company. Uh, number two, what's your current, John? What are you into right now? Oh, boy. Um, aside from the Philly music scene, of course, um, this is a tough one. It's like I read a lot of books, but I don't know that there's any particular series that I've been like honing in on, like, oh, got to read all of whatever, dot, dot, dot. I guess maybe just like... Um, just the idea of reading is that okay? Is that yeah, a good answer? Absolutely. The idea of reading? yeah, very much. Because so. um, no, I, I I during lockdown I got into using my Goodreads again, and I um I've managed to the past three years like set these Goodread Goodreads goals and meet them, which has been a lot of fun. And uh, last year, like Maureen and I have a lot of books, and um and last year I made a point to kind of like, okay, here's all the books on our fiction shelves that I've never read. So that's uh, part of my Goodreads this year. Goodreads goal this year is going to be reading all of them and like getting caught up on this section of the shelves. And now I'm into like musician bios. So like I, um, I have coming up, um, uh, there's a Graham Nash book, like his memoir. I want to read, uh, um, uh, for Christmas slash my birthday, uh, Bruce Warren got me, um, the Lal Tolhurst book, Goth. So I read that. Uh, that was a really good read. Uh, so yeah, I guess, I guess just kind of like, uh, so this year is going to be a lot of musician and artist bios, but I think, uh, yeah, just reading in general. That's a good I one. dig it. That's a good I can one. definitely dig it. Evergreen uh, for sure. <laughs> yes, very much so. I you again, you're talking to somebody who uh, I used to work uh, for Harvest Book Company in Fort Washington. I don't know if you're okay. familiar with them, but they were the okay. largest used and rare book reseller uh, on the East Coast for a while. Um, oh and God. it was the it was the best job I ever had in my life. Wait, where in, would that have been like on Commerce Drive or whatever? It is. Yeah. Yeah, it was right on the right on that corner bend right as you make that turn before you get to what was the subway and is now whatever it is there. Um Dude, I worked across the street from you at Montgomery Newspapers for like years. That was like my first job out of college. If I if if, if I'm thinking of geographically of the same uh, area, that turn where yeah, there was like a a hotel across the street that had a subway in it, right? Yep. Yeah. Oh my god. It's wild. Weird it's job, <laughs> but cool That's, job. Yeah. No, for me. Uh, oh, for you. Uh, um, no, like uh, being surrounded by books, uh, it, it like was probably when I was at my most creative too. Like it just was mm-hmm. just an inspiring job to be. And like I self-published a book that no one can find, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, <laughs> it's up on Amazon if anybody truly wants to find it, but it's not good. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> but that was probably the most creative I've ever been was in that period when I was working there. Nice. Hell yeah. yeah. Uh, number three, what was your first concert? What was the first live show you saw? My first live, John, was Nine Inch Nails, Jim Rose Circus, Marilyn Manson at the Spectrum in 1994. That's um, killer. And I, uh, I remember being c- completely terrified because um, my friend who I went with, he had a ticket for himself and his brother – and then they're like, oh, do you want to go too? So then I thought they had an extra ticket and I would have been sitting with them. And what they wound up doing was getting an extra ticket for me that was in the upper deck that I then paid them for, of course. But then like we got there and they're like, okay, we're sitting down here. You're up there somewhere. See you later. I'm like, wait a minute, what? And I'm like 14 years old. This is like one of the first times I'm like off on my own, uh, like, uh, you know, in like a big concert setting and kind of scared shitless and then like i got up upstairs upper upper nosebleeds where my seats were um and marilyn manson got up on stage which in retrospect it's like dude is super campy and like provocative in like a like 
theatrical way, but like I didn't know that as a child, and I'm like, this is terrifying, and then like, uh, but then like kind of exhilarating, and then like uh, 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 between that set and then um, Jim Rose, we went downstairs, uh, and or I went downstairs, and I found the section that my friend and his brother were in, and I just like ran down, like squoze into a seat next to them. And just stayed there for the rest of the show, and nobody questioned it. So, yep, <laughs> that's awesome and super memorable. I love it. I love it. Uh, number four, I think you just answered was Mitski uh, last concert last night, right? Yeah. Yep, Mitski uh, Mino. See, and it, it's funny because uh, with you, I, I, I uh, leading into this, I was like, I bet John's last concert is going to be the night before I do this interview, and it, of course it was. <laughs> yeah, and then by the time by the time you air the interview, it'll be somewhat out of date for sure, because uh, I probably will have seen like another handful of concerts as well. Uh, but no, Minsky with Tamino at the Met, the first night of their two night sold out run. Um, it was uh, very. Uh, it was very different from previous times I've seen Mitski. Like she's kind of moved her performance in more and more of a theatrical direction uh, with each tour and with each album. And uh, uh, the previous time I'd seen her was uh, the Franklin Music Hall, which was like super high energy, like loud rock songs, loud dance songs. She's like racing from one side of the stage to the other. And the new record that she's touring off of now um, is called The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We. Um, very mellow. And the performance was accordingly also very mellow and cinematic and like definitely felt like the band was playing like Western music, like like what mu- music for Westerns, like like movies. And um, and then what they did, too, was like her back catalog. They kind of like adapted the songs to these new arrangements. So like one of like I don't smoke was like a hoedown song uh there was a song that was like a samba song it was like really kind of cool to see her doing like it was not the show i expected i guess but on an artistic and creative level i really really admire it yeah that's awesome i dig it i dig it uh number five i'm sure it's a hard one for you to pick but uh what was your favorite concert i think uh radiohead in 2017 which is the last time maureen and i went abroad um, in Manchester, England at a cricket stadium. And so it was, oh man, let me try to tell the short version of this concert. We were planning, like we travel as much as we can. We're planning a trip for later this year that I'm kind of stoked about. It's going to be our first time out of the country since since this one, since 2017. Um, but we decided to plan this one particular trip around uh, a couple big concerts. So we saw the Stone Roses in Glasgow at the one end and then the other end, we got tickets to see uh, Radiohead, uh, and they were doing two nights at uh, this arena, um, like like indoor arena in Manchester, and we got tickets to the first night, which was the 4th of July. Um, this arena in question is the arena that was bombed during the Ariana Grande concert. Um, uh, I don't know if you remember that happening. I do, it's yeah. That, it's a thing that happened, and it was like really terrible. Um and so they basically just stopped down and st- like stopped having any events at this place. And it was kind of like, what's going to be, uh, what's going to come of these Radiohead concerts? And basically what they did was they took the two Radiohead concerts that were in an arena and combined them into one Radiohead concert in a stadium and honored all tickets and all that stuff. Um, and so like, like when we were not even sure if like, it, we, it was still going to fit in like the window of us traveling, and thankfully it was still on the same day. It was still on the fourth, and um, we wound up having GA tickets, which was amazing because we were like again stadium show experience. Like we're out on the field, and they're doing like Karma Police, and everyone is singing. You know, for a minute there, I lost myself, and it was just like, oh my god! And then the show gets done, and you know, we're all walking. Uh, back to our various like the light rail or like the bus or like I think we just basically straight walked back to our hotel it was like a longer walk but it was like a nice night and like as the crowd is leaving the stadium everyone is still singing for a minute there I lost myself and uh, it was kind of that was magical for sure and the band was just like I don't know they're 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 just such a good 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 live band um, with a great catalog and um, 
they make good use of it at that show for sure. <laughs> yeah, I uh, um, uh, I need uh, it's a moral imperative that I see the next time they come to town um, smile um, just mm. based off of how much I love this new album. Um, which yeah. I liked the first album a lot. It was really good. But this mm-hmm. one, um, start to finish, like just I, I, I started imagining what it'll sound like live and it, and it excites me beyond belief. Nice, nice. And that band, they they perform as a trio, right? Like they don't really, yeah, like they, 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 they keep it stripped down, whereas Radiohead, there's like six of them. So yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, number six, who have you never seen live that you wish you would have? They can be living or dead. Um, Nirvana. <laughs> I think part of the reason I go to so damn many concerts um, is Nirvana was my favorite band in high school. And I remember my freshman year of high school, uh, so 93, 94, I was a freshman. Um, my freshman year of high school, a bunch of my friends and peers and fellow classmates and whatever went to see Nirvana at the Civic Center and they came back the next day and they were wearing all their in utero swag and I'm like, oh my God, you got to see Nirvana. I wanted to go to see Nirvana. And like other people, oh, I'm sorry, was it the Drexel Armory? It was at the Drexel Armory. It wasn't the Civic Center. Um, and then other people went to see them at the Stabler Arena in Bethlehem. And I'm like, oh man, I wish I had seen Nirvana. And then, um, and then uh, we know how that story ended and I never got to see Nirvana and I was kind of like, um, well, I want to uh, make sure I see as many fans as I can because I missed out on my favorite band as a child. Yeah, that's uh, that's how I feel about um, so many. There's so many bands like that. Like um, I remember um, uh, Elliot Smith was playing, I want to say like the truck or the TLA. And I was mm-hmm. like, I'll catch him next time. And then like two months later, he was gone. And I was like, mm. shit. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, Chris Cornell was another one because they did that Temple of the Dog tour right before he passed away. Yeah, um, that was at this tower, right? Yeah, or was yeah. it some? Yeah, yeah like I remember, and I remember um, my friend Joe. Uh, I, I think my friend Joe Del Tufo photographed that show. He at least photographed a Chris Cornell related show. And I remember being aware of the show and like thinking like, oh, Joe got some really sick pictures of the show. I should see next time a Chris Cornell project comes through town. And then nope, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, it's a bummer, man. Uh, number seven, name an unappreciated John. Something you wish had more shine to it. Uh, this is this is this is going to require some pondering. It, and it can be anything. It doesn't just anything. Have to be... yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. I wish more people knew about dot dot dot. Um, <laughs> this is going to. I'm taking this in a um, not entirely expected direction, but I wish more people knew about Ridley Creek State Park. Um, it's in Media, Pennsylvania, um, and it is uh, basically a big old state park with like hiking trails and like I forget if it's like a lake or like some kind of there's some kind of body of water that like is is in there. But then there's also like a ton of oh, it's a creek, duh, creek, Ridley Creek. There you go, state park. <laughs> Way to go, John. Um, but no, uh, it's it's gorgeous and it's great. It, there, there's like this huge network of trails where you can do like a hike. Like a day hike, and that's something I really love doing. Like, um, just kind of like checking out, turning off my phone, and going out hiking or whatever. Um, like, like sometimes I've more recently gotten into the beach, but hiking is always like kind of my go-to favorite. And yeah, it's just like this network of trails where you can do like a easy like maybe half mile or like three quarters of a mile loop and only be out for like an hour. Or you could like the last time Maureen and I went, like we had planned like there was like an all trails variation on their map on their on their map where you could do a big loop that kind of is three and a half miles but it's like this loop connects with this loop which connects with this one and it's like you're out and around and then you're gone for almost like four hours and like man let me tell you like going out into a bunch of trees for four hours and all you hear is like the birds and bugs and you don't hear cars driving by and you're just with somebody whose company you enjoy and it's like the chillest, nicest day. It's like, I love that. That's awesome. Yeah, my, my wife and I, we, we, we hike a lot. So I'm going to have to add that to our, our list of uh, places to check out. Nice. Um, number eight, and a tough one, favorite album. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, I did make a, um, there was like a uh, meme years ago that was like, albums that change your life it was like when people started using like the uh before instagram really let you do the carousel but like could let you um 
make a grid on a single square post. Like there was like a thing that people were doing that was like, here's nine albums that changed your life in like the square. Um, I would say either OK Computer, which is a such a cliche answer for somebody of like <laughs> my age um just in the sense that like it really like you know I, I talked earlier about how i was like angsty and 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 very goth and nine inch nails oriented and bands that sounded like that and then like my 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 taste in musical worldview started like blossoming and like that was definitely a record that like really blew it up um uh in a big way uh into like other other sounds and other um scenes and other artists of like lots of different eras and uh i think i found out a lot about a lot of music in the wake of that that i wouldn't have five years earlier and it's a solid record front to back so i think that and then on the philly level i would say things fall apart by the roots uh which is just their masterpiece as far as i'm concerned and also i was um i was my second year at temple when that came out and uh, You Got Me was such a big, big hit. And, like, they were a band that I had liked uh, previously. Like, I saw them open for the Beastie Boys at the Civic Center in 95 or something. And that was my first experience with them. Like, whoa, this band is wild. And then um, and then I really liked their Illadelph Half-Life record. And so I, um, like, I was like, oh, new record from The Roots. Like, yeah, my favorite local band or whatever. And then, like... You Got Me became like this war- like global hit. And it was kind of like the first Philly band that I, I... I think the first Philly band I liked was probably the Goats. But the first Philly band that I was really kind of like cheering them on as they blew up was definitely The Roots. And and like that record is just like so like profound and emotional and like, like kind of giving voice to things that like I as a teenager from Ambler did not understand. And um, and then also talking about like... like like music industry culture and celebrity culture in a way that like again I as somebody who was not involved in this didn't understand so it's kind of like it, it it made me proud that a Philly band was succeeding and it also kind of like broadened my worldview you know as, as I, I guess that's in, 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 in its way so um, uh, yeah no I love that <laughs> I love that um, so I, I gotta ask uh, did you ever post on OK Player? I didn't know um, I I think at that point at the point that okay player was taking off um i was probably burnt out on message boards from having spent so much time like as a angsty teen on like prodigy adjacent message boards and like even though they, it was like different i think i was kind of like associated message boards with that and i kind of didn't really um like I think I was aware of it, and then I became aware of it later as a magazine and a website more so than like like a culture website more so than like a like networking kind of place. And I kind of like in retrospect, like hearing John Morrison talk about OK Player and like all the people he connected with there and how it really propelled him creatively and like inspired him kind of makes me wish that I had participated more. It probably would have like like escalated my hip hop education in a way that like you know I. Like stuff that I heard that I was hearing for the first time in my late twenties, I probably could have heard like a decade earlier if I had been more active there. But at that point, I was kind of like, "Nope, not touching message boards." Sorry. <laughs> it was wild. It was a wild space. And actually, I think yeah. uh, John and I have talked uh, that we are pretty sure that's how we uh, first uh, ever talked um, before we knew um, uh, who each other was. So <laughs> that's amazing. It's wild. Oh, yeah. uh, the uh, uh, n- number nine, name an artist whose output you'll consume anything they put out. Oh, my God. I mean, I think The Roots, again, because even if it's a record, like I think their last record, which I think was called And Then You Shoot Your Cousin. That's it. I don't think it was the most accessible record. Like it, it, it didn't have like, um, you know, like the way how I got over had all these songs with like John Legend hooks and like really easy like entry points um, or even like Undone, um, which is more like mellow and contemplative, but still had like Make My, which is like, I think one of their like, it's up there in the Roots canon. Um, uh, and then You Shoot Your Cousin didn't really have that. It was kind of more of like almost an art piece than a, than a, than a record um, or like a, like a, like song cycle, if you will. Um, uh and maybe I just need to spend more time with it and and find those points of connection. Uh, but fuck, man, I love listening to it. And whenever they put out their next thing, which 
last I didn't go to Roots Picnic last year, but I went the previous year when Mary J. Blige played, and they opened their set with like these new songs that I had not heard before that were very like disco influenced, and I was like. If this is what the new the new Roots album sounds like, I'm I'm all in. That's cool. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, the Roots for sure. Um, one of the things you should uh, dig in the archives there, if you've never heard it, is um, Questlove did this thing, um, Philly Paris Lockdown, and hmm. um, and it, it should be uh, in the World Cafe. Faye archives, I think. Okay. Um, but it was it, it was at the Kimmel Center, and um, and uh, he did it with um, I forget who all he was working with. Like Karen Ann was there, um, hmm. but it's this beautiful, beautiful. Like he took um, classical pieces and kind of put kind of hip hop breaks behind it and stuff like that. It's really, oh really incredible. He's one of those people who um, he's one of my stretch goals as a guest on here because we used to be passing acquaintances and I and and mm. and I was in you know frequent contact with him. And then I started this and now I don't talk to him anymore. And I'm like, uh. now you have an Oscar and I'm probably never going to talk to you again. But uh, you should still yes. try it. You know, and it's like one of those things too where like the more you can kind of like bring people into your circle that this person is aware of the more, like, you know, Questlove might not know you, but he knows Chuck Treese. So when you do land that Chuck Treese interview, which I'm confident you will, like, that's the point of like, oh, shit, Chuck did this. Yeah. You know, maybe uh, I should I, think I, about yeah. it. Like, uh, it'll happen. I, I, like, I, 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 I've, I've, I've already hit one of my stretch goals, which was G-Love, and, and now mm-hmm. we're, like, weirdly kind of friends or something. I don't know. It's weird. That's um, cool. So my, my three <laughs> stretch goals just are, uh, it was uh, G-Love, uh, Quest Love, as I said. And I, I, I like to say these a lot because I'm trying to manifest them. I like to say mm-hmm. them to manifest them. And uh, yeah, the big yeah. one is uh, John Oates. I need John Oates because uh-huh. John Oates is from North Wales, and I'm from North Wales. And uh-huh. I feel like we could talk about that for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um uh on the on the subject of like not not that I'm friend not that I've become friends with this person but just that this person acknowledged my existence and it's like maybe not even as big of a deal but like remember how I said like my first Philly band that I was really psyched about was the Goats. Yeah. Um yeah. and their record Tricks of the Shade was like huge for me not only as like like it was chock full of bangers it also definitely helped like informed my political consciousness as a teenager, um, and uh, I think you want to go back to like the who didn't get their due or who's somebody who should be uh, more who more people like w- w- I think it was John three that was like what do you wish had more shine to it I wish more people on a musical level to answer that question not from a Ridley Creek State Park level but from a musical level I would say I wish more people knew about the goats because they're fucking. They're ahead of their time. You can put on Tricks of the Shade and they could be singing about the world now, like today. And it's it's like I wrote a thing about a live album that they put out. It's like a live at the Kyber Pass release that's on their Spotify that they released a couple of years ago. Um, and I said something like that either says a lot about how like their perceptiveness and foresight in 1992 or how not far we've come as a society since 1992, you know. But I wrote this piece about this live record that they released, and I was kind of, like, using it as, like, a more people should know about the goats. And, like, uh, Max used to do Black Landlord. Um, That was one of his post-goats projects. I don't know that he does music anymore. Odie definitely does not do music anymore. He, like, I think is involved in, like, uh, environmental activism and racial justice, like, uh, causes, uh, at least per his Twitter bio, when he found my review and tweeted about it and tagged me, and I'm like, Odie from the Goaties is talking about my review? Oh my god, and I had, I don't use Twitter anymore, I don't really, it became a dumpster fire, X, excuse me, it became a bit of a dumpster fire, and even more so, um, as after, like, post-Elon, so I go on very occasionally to, like, post about my show, or post about, like, a, a like, the mannequin posted for eight noon, for example. Um, so like I had, I looked at my mentions for the first time in like two weeks. I'm like, Odie's tweeting at me. Right. And I like, all I could think about to reply was like, Oh my God, I never use this site anymore, but like, I'm so glad you found my review and thank you so much for your music. It's meant so much to me. Like kind of a cheesy sentiment, I'm sure, but it was like, man, Anyway, that, I'm sorry. That, no, that's beautiful. <laughs> I love that. You know, I don't know if you know this or not, but um, last year I talked to EJ Simpson, who played bass uh, for all the goat stuff, and yeah. he said they got back together um, and were working on something, but it kind of fell oh apart. God. 
Uh-huh. And I don't know how uh, you uh, you have connections. Find that. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll, I I met EJ once, and he was a really sweet person. He came to, um, uh, I uh, me and the folks at World Cafe Live co curated a tribute to Jeff Buckley's Grace, um, and I think uh, EJ's post Goats band Maggie Pierce and EJ, which was more like folk rock oriented either open for Buckley or did some gigging with him. And so Jeff meant a lot to EJ. And he came out to this show and introduced himself. And I'm like, oh, my God, like, I know you. <laughs> um, yeah, the yeah. Um, we, we he um, was at the I don't know if you know this or not, but Jeff Buckley played Grape Street um, in Man. Oh, my God. And uh, just randomly. And uh, uh, I talked to EJ about it because he was there. And I think afterwards he said they all like went back and like jammed and stuff like that. And I think one of those songs is on, I forget which Maggie Pearson EJ album it's on. Um, but one of those mm. songs that they worked on with Jeff is on that. Uh, it's like the White Album, maybe. I can't remember okay. exactly. but um, That's amazing. But yeah. I, and, you know, I mentioned earlier that I was talking to or that I just talked to uh Craig Wedren, uh, I, I asked him straight up, I was like, do you still have the isolated vocal tracks of I Want Someone Badly? And mm. he was like, no, I think Sony has that. And I was like, God damn it. Uh. I, that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I had to make a play for it. I, Jeff yeah. Buckley's one of my um, North Stars. Like, uh, that mm. is um, somebody who was incredibly influential to me um, without ever influencing my music specifically because mm. I don't think I could even, like, I would never even attempt to do something as beautiful and brilliant as what he used mm. to do um, mm. to the point. <laughs> Um, he saved my life. Um, mm. and it's going to sound, it's going to sound crass, but I was, uh, in, in my like late twenties, um, I was in ocean city, Maryland and I was ridiculously drunk and mm. I, it was like 3am in the morning. Nobody was back. Um, I was the first person back in the hotel room and I left a note and I said, I'm going out swimming. If I'm not back by dawn, call search and rescue. <laughs> and, oh, I Jesus. Went, and, and I went out into the water and I was, and it was the strongest undertow I ever felt in my life. And mm. I had this quick thought in my head, which was, I have never even thought of something that is even a fraction as brilliant as grace. Mm. Get out of the water right now. Mm. <laughs> and mm. and that saved my life. Like, uh, Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, I just, I really, I really wish he was still here because I really would love to have known what kind of creative force he would have become. Mm hmm. Same. Yeah. Like even hearing like the like the rough stuff on sketches is like, wow. Or like the produced stuff on sketches where it was like, yeah, this isn't what I was going for. And it's like, this is fucking amazing. What do you mean this isn't what you're going, you know? So, um, yeah, no. Yeah. One of those fragments uh, uh, is my favorite Jeff Buckley song period of all time. And that's uh, Morning Theft, which I think is mm. just absolutely hauntingly beautiful. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> It's great. Yeah. It's great. I can't believe I've now twice got to talk about Jeff Buckley in a row. It's perfect. I love it. Nice. <laughs> uh, nice. Number number 10, uh, the okay. last of the top 10 countdown. What is your favorite John of all time? Can be anything you want it to be. Oh, my God. Um, Acadia National Park, Maine. Uh, see previous answer about uh, hiking and uh, kind of just like disconnecting and being at one with like nature and the world with somebody who uh, you... Uh, enjoy their company and like Maureen and I have gone a few times and I've gone with my family as well and it's just it's beautiful it's like um it's hiking it's mountainous hiking but it's not like when you go out west and like hiking in the Rockies or in California where it's like you need to be at a certain level of like experience and like physical whatever to even attempt this like like Acadia, it's like you can hike Cadillac Mountain, which is like the tallest mountain on that part of like the state, and it's like doable if you're a ten year old child or if you're like a grown ass person. And if you don't want to hike it, you can drive up to the top. But then there's other like long hikes that you can do of like varying degrees of like challenge. And um, I don't know. I I I I. I it's it's beautiful. Like it's mountainous, but it's also like coastal because it's on an island. You know. And then there's this super cute town 
nestled in there too called Bar Harbor that's like basically a New Hope-esque sort of place um but super cute um it's just like great I mean I know it's like Maine is vacation land but like truly it's a great place to 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 go and get away and see beautiful things that's awesome. I love that so much. That's so cool. I've never been. I, it's, uh, I'll have to add that to a destination lift. Like I said, like hiking um, is something that I was never really into, um, but my mm-hmm. wife was. And like uh, ever since I started doing it with her, like, you know, mm-hmm. um, pr- prior to her, the only kind of hiking I ever liked doing was uh, I played disc golf. So, you know, mm-hmm. hiking with a purpose. Um, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like uh, I, lo- I love that. That's a that's a beautiful answer. Uh, so uh, uh, XPN local, obviously, and then uh, what's the frequency? As you mentioned, now weekly, uh, which is now super weekly. exciting. I can't believe it. Like it's something I've wanted uh, forever. And also, Land of the Lost being weekly uh, is yeah. amazing to me too. Like um, the 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 whole new programming just was really exciting to see because uh, I feel like it it just speaks to like uh, uh, the the state of the station. Like I, I think. I think that growth is is something really beautiful. Thank you, man. And I, I I'm I'm really excited about it too. Like I, it's funny when people. It used to be like when people would ask me like, "When are you going weekly?" I'd be like, "Ha ha!" I can you know, like doing it once a month is a lot. But then um, it's kind of taught me to think about how I program the show in a different way. And whereas like I used to like I I, I used to lean heavily into like the full on request situation. Um, and now, I mean, I'll still totally, if people like like what I'm playing and they email me or DM me or get in touch some way and say, can you play this? I'll play it. I may save it for the next week's show, but I'll still totally play requests. But like, it's it's cool to think about like a smaller time frame and a more focused, like, what can I theme it around this month? And no, it's been, it's been a blast. It's, it's cool to be part of like the whole like, like 70s to 80s to 90s continuum that the Friday night is now too. So yeah, I love it. And um, so far, it's been uh, you know a few weeks in. I've been managing it okay, and hopefully that continues to be the case. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome, and I love it. Uh, if these cool cats and kittens who watch this show or listen to the show, I should say, uh, want to track you down, what's the best way to find you on the socials? Uh, best way uh, is my Instagram. It's where I'm most active, and I'm just at John Vitis on Instagram. J O H N V E T T E S E. John, thank you so much for coming on the show, chatting with me, and more importantly, thank you for everything you've done for this music community. Um, it, I, I, I say it, and I can't say it enough. Uh, I admire everything you do, uh, and uh, I am so glad that we finally got a chance to chat. Thank you, Nate. Thank you for having me. This has been so much fun, and. I, I, I could easily talk for several more hours about music. <laughs> uh, but thank you for having me. This has, been, this has been awesome. My thanks again to John for joining me on the show today. You can hear John every week from 8 to 10 p.m. on Tuesday nights for the WXPN Local Show and every Friday from 9 to 11 p.m. for the 90s show, What's the Frequency? And, of course, you can read his articles up on xpn.org and follow him on Instagram at John Vatisse. Links to all of those are, of course, in the show notes. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to subscribe to the Yo, That's My John podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. And, guys, it is not too late to get yourself a super awesome John Scout merit badge for citizenship of the world just by rating and reviewing us. Don't forget to visit www.yothatsmyjohn.com for the link tree to links to articles, merchandise, all of the previous episodes of this podcast, guest appearance on other pods, and more. And while you are there, be sure to sign up for our mailing list to get all of the updates delivered straight into your inbox. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash yo that's my John for updates and live streams. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter X, and Threads at Yo That's My John, and search Yo That's My John on YouTube to find the Yo That's My John YouTube channel. Like and subscribe the heck out of that ish. We want to hear from you. Reach out, reach out, and touch some John. Another week down. Thanks, as always, for joining. And if you're listening to this on Monday, don't forget to tune in to Why Not Radio to catch me every Monday evening from 5 to 8 p.m. You can find that on your smart speaker of choice by visiting whynotradio.net or by downloading the app in your phone's app store. Cool. Blue skies. Until next time, everybody. 
that's my John. Yo, That's My John is a Lonely Monk production. Written and produced by yours truly, Nate Runkle. Theme song by me, under the moniker Nate 3.0. Special thanks to Fox Run Brands, DX Ferris, Andrew Scott, Maggie Poulos, Dan Drago, Natalie Runkle, and the beautifully vibrant and wickedly stunning Katie Daubney. If you or anyone you know has any ideas they would like to share or any guests they would like to hear on the podcast, please feel free to reach out to us at yo that's my john at gmail.com or hit us up on the socials at yo that's my john. Until next time, be sure to displace the guilt and embrace the pleasure. Tilt your head back and shout to the world, yo. That's my John. <laughs>